Well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm so glad to be here and I just want to make sure to thank um, Dr. Tiffany Lee and Dr. Taylor Taylor for opening up. Uh, this is their very first official seminar here at Ashburn <laughs> National Wellness. Um, so I appreciate them uh, inviting me here to do this. Um, as you may or may not know, <laughs> uh, tonight I'm just going to be sharing with you a bunch of really you know, helpful tips. I think things that you can use throughout the day, whether you're a student or you know, working with people or you know, teaching, working with small kids, uh, working with babies, <laughs> whatever the case may be, um, you know, we all experience aches and pains throughout the day. It's just part of being on this earth. And um, I have a lot of fun little tips that you can use to uh, kind of counteract and just fight against those common aches and pains. So hopefully you'll leave here with a little bit more knowledge about um, what you can do to just help your body heal itself. Because you know, that's really what we want to have happen in, in whatever you know, situation we can as much as possible. All right, um, does anybody have any like concerns, specific concerns that you want me to focus on more? Like anybody experiencing back pain or knee issues or shoulder issues? Or should I just kind of talk generally? Generally sounds yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. that's you. All right, I told my husband I might use um, his story, his back pain story sometime here if we could a minute to put that in. <laughs> he gave me permission. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I just thought I'd show you uh, a little bit of an outline about what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, we're going to go th through some cliches about uh, pain that you might want to, um, you know, decide if you like, uh, if you agree with them or not, if you think they're true or false. Uh, I'll talk very briefly about um, uh, something called the pain classification system, which just <coughs> helps us practitioners to know, you know, how, what is your pain? I mean, pain is, a, is there's such a broad spectrum of what pain can be. Uh, so we'll just talk a little bit about that. That's a little bit technical. Um, we'll talk a lot about mechanical pain. You'll hear me say that word a lot and things that you can do for that. But then we're really, as I said earlier, going to focus on posture hacks and movement hacks. And then, um, you know, if you have questions or you want some individual advice, I'll be sure to, um, take any questions at the end. Okay? Good. All right, well why don't we start by crushing some cliches. That's Taylor right there doing her one arm push-up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, most people hear this term, move it or lose it, right? So how many of you think that that's true? Move it or lose it? Yeah, yeah. good. You're right. getting used to this animation stuff on pin, pin, or, uh, PowerPoint. Yes, that is true. Um, I found this on you know, good old uh, Dr. Google. The Mayo Clinic's uh, seven positive effects of exercise. Obviously, controls body weight, combats disease, um, and particularly you know, these chronic disease conditions that we as a society are trying to you know, get under control as much as possible. Improves mood, boosts energy, promotes better sleep, puts a little spark in that sex life, and it's fun and social. I, I mean, if I'm ever in a bad mood, all I have to do is go play some volleyball, right? <laughs> These guys both play volleyball, and um, you know, movement is just the best way. You'll hear me say this a lot. It's the best way to release the uh, kind of drug cabinet we have locked away in our brains, and all those endorphins, encephalons, serotonins. You need to get the, you know, the mood boosted if you're having issues with depression. Exercise is one of the key ways to manage that. Good. All right. So everybody here agreed on that. What about the term, it's just muscular? I hear this a lot from patients. They come in, they're like, oh, it's not a problem. It's just muscular. My, you know, it's my trapezius. <laughs> you know, do you, and some of you may have said that to your own doctor, or I'm sure you've heard patients say that. What do you think about that? Do you think that's true? No? Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's actually kind of false from my perspective. Now, I think there's different ways to look at it, but I think of it as, gosh, these, you know, our poor muscles, they're taking a lot of blame for things, and it might not necessarily be the muscle. When we have a pain in an area, 
our first thought is to blame that muscle. Like, oh my gosh, my quad. Or, you know, oh, I just, I pulled a muscle in my back. How many times have you heard that? Mm -hmm. I pulled a muscle in my back. Well, there's a lot of different reasons for pain. And there's a, a lot of different ways to get rid of a pain in a muscle without actually even moving that muscle. And from my perspective, it doesn't really matter what is causing the, t the pain. It's the tissue source of pain doesn't really matter if you can figure out a simple movement to alleviate it. And oftentimes it's more of a joint related issue and there's referred pain down the nerves to that area which we in our minds think of as the muscle. But it probably is more like a joint is out of position or a nerve is being pinched somewhere either from the spine or uh, around a joint. Um, so the next time you, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, oh my, I always hear people say, oh, I, I pulled a glute, you know, I strained my glute. <laughs> the next time you want to say that, just stop and think and like, hmm, you know, how have I been sitting all day? Or did I just drive eight hours to go somewhere on vacation? You can't strain your glute if you've been sitting in the chair, <laughs> okay? But your, your pain might be there. Your pain might have referred to that area. So give your muscles a break. <laughs> Um, and here's another reason that we want to kind of get away from this idea of blaming different tissues in our body. MRIs have been considered the gold standard for diagnosing different bodily issues, particularly soft tissue, right, because x-rays can only see bone um, and positioning of bones. But uh, MRI has been considered the gold standard because they can see, they can show us what's going on with the soft tissue, cartilage tendons, muscle um, to some extent. Um, but look at those numbers, it's very interesting. Can you, I don't know if you can read that. So for people who have been uh, in a work-related problem, um, hey, hi, hi, come over here. Oh, oh, perfect. People who've been in uh, work-related injuries, um, those who go, uh, you know, just maybe straight to the physical therapist or the chiropractor, uh, their duration of their problem is around 22 days average. This was a study done in 2010, so it's not too old. Um, but for folks who went to a doctor who may have said, oh, it's muscular, I'm going to go ahead and send you, or it's, you know, whatever, let's go and have an MRI. The duration of their, their treatment takes, look, like, a lot longer, you know? That's not so great. And then look at the difference in the cost. $2,000 compared to $20, $21,000. And then how, look at how many of those people end up having surgery compared to less than 10% or less than 1% of those folks who had early non-MRI intervention. So, um, so as much as you can get away from the MRI situation is good. And, and can anybody say why that might be? Any, any guesses? You too can't say. <laughs> <laughs> Any speculations on why that might be? Well, I know like in an MRI you can tell if a disc is like completely slipped. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that freaks out a lot of patients, mm -hmm. meaning they need to get surgery or you, know, mm -hmm. you won't be able to be pain free without it. But um, like with an x-ray you just see bone so it wouldn't be uh, that much help. Mm -hmm. But if you're able to get rid of the pain without the surgery, I mean, you'll be that much better off. Right, and so fear is a huge thing, yeah, and we'll talk about the, that more later. Right. That um, fear and the the generators of pain in our brain are very much interconnected. And so, yeah, when you see something scary on an MRI, your pain can just all of a sudden skyrocket just because of that. So you're right, exactly. But surgeons don't make money if they're not doing surgery. <laughs> 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 yes, that is true. Um, but here's an interesting thing, and I don't have the slide to show you this, but um, there's been some more recent studies showing the, the high number of abnormal looking studies on P MRI studies of people who have absolutely no pain. There's a very high number, even for 20 year olds. You know, the, the number of torn menisci that show up in MRIs of people who have no knee pain at all is around 30%. So, you know, keep that in mind, that the MRI tells us the truth, but it doesn't tell us the whole truth. It can't tell us what is causing the pain, okay? 
So you know, the next time you see a doctor that says, oh, let's just have you see, you know, go get that MRI first, you know, think twice about that. Okay, did I crush that cliche pretty well? <laughs> All right, uh, what about this one? This is not something, you know, in our circles, I think we might hear this more, but um, what about hurt equals harm? If, you're, if you've hurt something, if you've injured it, that there's definitely something torn or ripped or broken. What do you think? think that's true or false? Raise your hand if you think that's true. No? Okay, good, yeah. Pain doesn't necessarily mean that something is broken or something is, uh, you know, hurt or harmed. Now, there are, you know, traumas, obviously, you know, you <coughs> jumped up 10 feet to smack a volleyball and you come down and land on somebody's foot and boom, you know, pop, sudden pain. Yeah, chances of something being off there are pretty high. Um, but when we just have everyday aches and pains, typically we're not going to have any sort of tissue damage. And a way you can gauge this, and I'll show you um, a nice little pain pyramid in the next slide. Um, are you able to, you can kind of gauge this by saying, you know, do I have the same range of motion? Can I still fully straighten my knee? Even though it hurts, can I still fully straighten it? Can I still fully bend it? That's one way to gauge if there's been any tissue damage. Um, did you have this pain before the activity or injury? A lot of people like to blame exercise for a pain that they actually had previously, but just weren't paying attention to it. But then they go and do an exercise, and they're like, they go and sit to have a beer, and then they stand up and they're like, oh man, my back, it must have been that volleyball game I played in, or you know? Have you ever done that? Where it's like, what was the activity I just did? I need to blame my pain on that. Um, but chances are the pain you've had, you've, you've had it previously, and if, if it's been a long time, kind of intermittent coming and going, chances are it's just a, a recurring kind of uh, joint displacement sort of a situation, um, and nothing is really broken or damaged or injured. Um, and then also using the VAS, that stands for the Visual Analog Scale, which, you know, every time you go to see a doctor or if you're in the hospital, I'll say, uh, you know, rate your pain on the 0 to 10 scale. That's what the VAS is. Um, so, you know, you can kind of gauge, you know, do I have pain before the activity? What number is it on that scale? Um, you know, what about during the activity or after the activity? So that's another way to kind of gauge how, um, you know, this pain that you might be having, is it something that is actually related to tissue damage? Um, if the, if and I'll show you in this next slide, there's, you know, if it's more than three points higher than your baseline pain, then yeah, you probably need to pay attention to it. Um, and then, like I said earlier, are you still able to move your joints the same as before your activity injury? If the answer is yes, then there's probably been no tissue damage. And same thing, you know, are you able to exert the same amount of force? Are you still able to, you know, pick up your child or, or curl some you know, um, weights? And here's that pain pyramid. So. Um, it's a little bit hard to see that, but um, this is a really nice resource I give, particularly to people who have had chronic pain, people who've had a pain coming and going, or sometimes not even going, uh, for you know, more than six months or so, we call that chronic pain, and those folks can do a lot of things to exercise and get that pain under control, as long as they don't have that fear factor of, gosh, if I exercise, I'm going to get worse, I'm going to hurt myself. And this pain scale, uh, this pain pyramid scale, just gives a lot of people peace about, uh, you know, I can go ahead and have an increase of three points that lasts for maybe 24 hours, but it goes back to baseline. That's okay. So, you know, people can start to feel comfortable about moving even though they might have pain. Um, and that's, it, chronic pain is so interesting because there's a lot of great research and that brings us to this next cliche. Has anybody ever told you that pain is all in your head? <laughs> like, hmm, maybe I told my husband that. <laughs> so what do you think about that one? If somebody said that to you, would you be like, yeah, you're right? Or would you say, what? You're full of it. You'd say true? Okay. <laughs> Guess what? You're right, Jacob. 
pain is all in our brain. There, that's what, um, you know, the, there's just this paradigm shift now. If you, we don't have a, a brain, we would never feel pain. Because our body doesn't have any way of saying, okay, this is pain. Our body has nerves that send messages to our brain. It's up to the brain to interpret those messages. And when we're in a situation where we feel like, oh my gosh, my body is in danger, that's when the brain is going to say, that's pain. Because that's what, you know, all the fight or flight mechanisms start to kick in, right? And here's a really good example to think about. Think of um, phantom limb pain for people who've had amputations. Why do they still feel pain in that foot or whatever? It's not there. It's because the brain has the homunculus, we were talking about this earlier, this picture of the brain, I'm sorry, this, this picture of the body is imprinted on the brain. And even though that limb is gone, it's still up there in the brain. And the brain can remember like, oh, maybe this guy who lost his leg sprained his ankle three years before, and the brain is still remembering that that happened. And particularly, maybe he'll see somebody sprain their ankle, and all of a sudden his ankle is hurting, even though he doesn't have one. So, yeah, that's, does that help to kind of help you wrap your head around that concept? If you don't have a brain, you're never going to have pain. And um, there's no way that your body can, can uh, decide whether or not something going on in your body is painful. Only the brain can do that. So if somebody says that to you, your pain is all in your head, you say, yeah, you're right, you're a smart person. <laughs> You've been reading up on all the latest literature, haven't you? <laughs> um, so yes, this uh, past 10 years of pain neurophysiology is showing that the pain is all in our brains. Nerves from our body send electrical impulse, but it's up to the brain to interpret that. Based on context, and there, that's when we get in with the pain, the fear. If the brain, brain perceives that the body's in danger, hence fear, uh, then pain is the message that the spinal cord receives. So I spend a lot of time talking to my chronic pain patients about you don't have to be afraid. I can't tell you the number of times people say to me, I'm so afraid I'm going to end up like, you know, Uncle Sam who, you know, is bent over like this. And once we take that fear away, the pain usually ends up going away as well, which is an, a cool thing to see. All right, so this is the pain mechanism classification system. Um, and I really like this system because it's developed by um, two therapists who have the same classification, I'm sorry, the same certification as I do, which is the mechanical diagnostic uh, therapy. Um, so this is a lot of technical terminology, but these first three are kind of the common everyday pains that we're gonna be talking about. Um, inflammatory would be a new injury where we get, you know, chemicals rush into the injury tr to help the healing process, which is good, however, it does cause pain. Um, but again, if we tell ourselves, hey, you know, this is normal, this is what my body should be doing, I don't have to be afraid of it, I don't have to panic about it, then our pain levels can come down. Um, ischemia, that refers to a lack of blood flow. So for instance, when a nerve is impinged, maybe at our neck, we start to get nerve pain down the arm. It's because the blood flow to the nerve is being uh, irritated, uh, lessened, I guess would be a better word. Um, and simply by moving around what's impinging the nerve at the neck level, we can oftentimes get rid of carpal tunnel or you know, tennis elbow, which doctors are classic, and, I, and I'm not here to bash doctors. If any of you are doctors, I'm sorry, but <laughs> doctors have been trained, and that's what they know is to diagnose things based on body parts, okay? This is a different way of diagnosing things. We diagnose things based on how they're behaving. How do they respond to movement? How do they respond to uh, ice or, or heat? So, um, so we don't get into anatomical diagnoses or pathoanatomical diagnoses. We get into what classification are you falling in and then we have a specific way to treat things based on that. So it's a whole different way of thinking about pain or in orthopedic problems. But it's been shown to be quite effective. And um, I'm hoping that we're going to have more of a paradigm shift towards this type of um, uh, 
classific classification of problems because that's going to lessen the amount of MRIs, which are very costly, that lessen the amount of surgeries, which are hugely costly. <coughs> So anyway, I won't talk too much more about this. The, the last three are more um, like central sensitization or for people who have had chronic pain and their, their system is just revved up and instead of like a little, you know, like a nice little ding dong, somebody's at the door, it's like eh, somebody's always at the door and they always want to get in. That's kind of what happens with central sensitization. It just, the, the whole pain, um, what's the word I'm looking for? the whole pain um, response system and uh, is just heightened. It's, it's very much irritated all the time and it just keeps right spiraling upward. Affective, a lot of our emotions are tied in with our pain. We just talked a lot about fear, depression, um, you know, people who've been through trauma or abuse in early in life are very much uh, prone to chronic pain situations. So that's a whole other realm that gets more into psychology. Oftentimes I, I try to help people along those routes, but um, usually I have to reach out to uh, psychologists and psychiatrists who deal with chronic pain. Okay, any questions so far? Am I giving you too much information? <laughs> Good, okay. I try to throw in a lot in here and sometimes I realize it's a little much. Okay, um, so when we get into mechanical pain, which um, a lot of the books out here that you see are uh, helping you to understand how you can treat mechanical pain, there's three subgroups. The, the majority of patients I see, as you see here, 70 to 80% of people will have mechanical pain. And the, those little quizzes that I gave you um, are ways for you to know whether or not your pain is mechanical. If it's a rapidly changing kind of a situation, or if it's a, gosh, sometimes I have the pain here, but then sometimes I feel it here, and sometimes I feel it all the way down here, and I just don't know what causes it, that's often a mechanical kind of a pain. So, um, you know, you might hear somebody say, my back went out, or I slipped a disc, or I blew out my knee, but you know, those types of mechanical, they were caused by some sort of a mechanical force, oftentimes, um, whether sustained or, or just instantaneous. Here's an example of, this was my very first telehealth patient. She's a, a volleyball player from uh, my daughter's college. Um, she had been unable to play volleyball for like a year. She missed her entire senior season. She was really bummed. She was getting depressed. Um, she was trying to be the team like manager, but she could barely tolerate sitting on the bus and traveling with the team. And so my daughter was like, you gotta talk to my mom, just talk to my mom. So um, I was able to connect with her online and you know, she told me her story, I took her whole history, and I was like, oh man, I, I'm kind of thinking what's going on here. So I said, do you mind just like showing me your spine? And I don't know, can you tell, can you tell that the upper half of her body is kind of to the left and the lower half is more to the right? Mm -hmm. That's what we call a lateral shift. And Tiffany, you might have talked about that at your course this weekend. That is such a common thing that's missed by so many doctors who aren't trained to look at it and it's a, it's a source of pain usually one-sided back pain and or limb pain um, that is very it's difficult to, to get rid of but once you do it gets it gets calmed down pretty quickly so I was able to tell her what to do so she was shifted <coughs> like this and and I was like okay try just pushing yourself back the other way and like oh man oh man oh man I'm getting worse and finally I had her do it against a wall and um, she was starting to get nauseous and I was like oh do you have anybody <laughs> like she's in New she's in uh, Rhode Island I'm in Virginia I was like is anybody there with you no I'm by myself I was like oh my god go sit down because I don't want you to pass out because <laughs> I can't help you very easily but. Um, she worked on that movement and then we worked on uh, extension, which like, I'll tell you, most people need to do extension for back pain. Um, she was better in two weeks. She was back playing volleyball in two weeks. And she would have been able to play in the last game of her senior year, except she got a concussion at practice the week before. And she got a spike to the face. She was so bummed. But, sounds like she's not meant to play ball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She, she was really cute. And then about a year later, after she graduated, she called me while we were at the beach, and she's like, 
Dr. Skyler, my back did the same thing. I was like, don't panic. And, and I ta literally talked her through it on the phone and she was finding it. So, but the scary thing is she had gone for three MRIs, two neurosurgeons were telling her she needed surgery and she was just like, I'm too young to have surgery. I just, I'm not going to do it. She was refusing to do it. So that's the scary thing. Okay, so another uh, subgroup is called the dysfunction group, and that's typically uh, something related to abnormal tissue healing, so like scar tissue is one way you would think about it. Uh, results in restricted range of motion. Typically we see this pain is only like, like say, imagine you've broken an arm and you've been in a cast, and you get out, your, you get the cast off, but oh my gosh, I can't really straighten my arm. And it really only hurts when you get to the very end of that range of motion, and then as soon as you pull it back into that you know, more comfortable position, it's fine. So that's what we call a dysfunctional type of pain, although that's a terrible word. People love it when I say, oh, you have a derangement. And they say, oh, I'm going to tell my wife you told me I was deranged. <laughs> um, so we see this a lot after surgeries, three months after a sprained ankle, that type of thing. This gentleman, so I went to Peru two years ago to work with um, a group of uh, mechanically trained therapists like myself. This poor gentleman, he really just wanted me to help him with his knees because he couldn't bend down to like, you know, pick up all his potatoes out of his potato farm. Um, and I was like, what's going on with your arm? And he took, because he wasn't moving his um, wrist at all, so he took off his coat. Well, his arm had gotten stuck in um, some kind of a farm equipment, and the doctors there just literally took out his entire ulna. <laughs> And, um, and, and because of the surgery here, he had lost a lot of his, um, yes, it's an ulnectomy. Have you ever heard of an ulnectomy? <laughs> 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 uh, Debbie, you're an OT, I'm sure you've never seen it. Oh, I, this poor man. He, he really had, not, I mean, this was an old injury, 10 years. But because of the way it had healed, he had not, he really had no function in his wrist and no, he couldn't supinate it hardly at all like that. I think I was asking him to supinate there, which is turning your palm up. So that's a, you know, that's a much longer type of a healing situation and, and remodeling the tissue. And, and this um, uh, tendonitis, tendinopathies is what they're calling them now, fall into this uh, category because it's a, a matter of remodeling that inflamed tissue and loading it and stressing it. You almost have to get it to the point of pain in order to promote the healing process and actually changing the cells to a more healthier cell. Okay, so we're getting to the, the meat of the, the reason you all came, which is to hear about how you can improve your posture. So this handsome gentleman <laughs> um, works at the computer a lot. And sometimes, although you have less neck pain than me, which I don't have quite figured out, um, sometimes his physical therapist's wife says, your posture looks terrible. <laughs> uh, you, your back hurts you more than your neck. Um, so what I do then is I just come over and say, okay, great, look at that. So when you're sitting like this for too long and you're getting uncomfortable, what should you do? What, what do you do without even really thinking about it? Change your position. Change your position. Now, if you're in a situation like you've got to get your work done, and you, or you're, you're like at, in a meeting, you might not really be able to change your position, right? Um, and a lot of people nowadays have those nice standing desks, but a lot of people don't. So, so when we're stuck in a position with not great ergonomics, the best thing we can do is just move our spine. Like if you're sitting in the car for a long time, sitting backward and then forward again. And getting that spine to move while you're stuck in the seated position is the number one thing I tell people to do if they can't get up and change position. Okay, so when you're sitting, which a lot of us are doing at our computers these days, you want to get out of that poor position and move more into a position where your ears are over your shoulders. Everybody scoop forward to the front of your chair and you can try this. So you want to get your ears back over your shoulders shoulders over your hips, and you want to actually increase this curvature in your back. A lot of you have been told never arch your back forward, right, or, or go, you know, we call this extension. But to, that honestly is the best position to protect your spine in. And the way you do that is you lift your collarbones up to the ceiling, that brings your ears back over your shoulders, 
shoulders over your hips. And what I recommend that you do is put um, some kind of a support. You know, you can take a towel, roll it up like that, stick it in the small of your back. So Chris, scoot all the way back into your chair and then sit up nice and tall and straight. Lean your hips, your chest forward, and this just slides down right to that point, and then you can lean back over that. Okay? Do you feel how it's pushing your lumbar spine forward, and that brings everything above backwards? Anybody else want to try it? You can pass it down the row there. <clears throat> so that is the number one thing that I recommend for folks. Scoot your, your tailbone all the way back in the chair first, and then it should go down low until it can't go down any further. Yeah, and it should feel like, okay, wow, it's really pressing me forward, but as you sit longer, it will compress and become a little bit more natural feeling. Some people need it to be a little smaller. But the lumbar roll is the number one thing I recommend to people with low back pain. It's a good stretch. <laughs> it is, right? Because if you've been sitting like this all day long, your spine's kind of getting used to being here. And what happens is the tissues on our back, which are muscles, tendons, ligaments, they get stretched out and the muscles in the front of our body get tight. You know, have you ever seen like guys who do a lot of weightlifting? Not Chase, Chase has good posture. <laughs> um, but they kind of get rounded forward and pulled forward it's because everything in the front is so strong and they haven't balanced it out by strengthening the muscles in the back. Um, I don't see that as much anymore, so that's a good thing. So yes, posture supports like the lumbar roll are become very important. Um, another one, oh yeah, here's one that's been well loved. This is a little bit, is that a smaller diameter one than that? No, I guess it's the same. Yeah, so that's what it looks like out of the um, package if anybody wants to try that. Um, this I'm not gonna pass around because this is mine and it's kind of grungy, but I did <laughs> spray it with Febreze. <laughs> um, but this is a really nice support for, uh, and Jenny, if you can grab the, the one in the package, people can kind of take a look at that if they want. If anybody wakes up with neck pain, this is one of the first, <laughs> maybe you, <laughs> this is one of the first things I recommend to people because we tend to sleep in, maybe if you're using more than one pillow too, we tend to sleep with our heads like this. Or if we're on um, our sides, we tend to sleep like this. So we're just out of alignment for who knows how long, it could be two or three hours. So by having this kind of resting in the small of the neck, whether you're on your side or on your back, um, it just helps to maintain better alignment in the, that whole cervical spine area. So um, I don't really have a picture of how that works, but you can lay it on top of a pillow or stick it, uh, slide it underneath the pillowcase to help hold it in place. Can I buy this today? You can. <laughs> yes. I, I brought a few things just in case people wanted to purchase them. I'm gonna out of sweat because it's too red. <laughs> She's playing it. She's fine. Okay, you got it. It's yours. Um, oh, I forgot to bring in my back support from the car. Oh well. Um, mattresses, you know, mattresses are expensive items to change, right? Um, and so I will think of lots of different ways to try to help people with nighttime pain. Um, but sometimes it does come down to you just need a new mattress. And typically people need a more firm mattress and not a softer mattress. Older, softer mattresses tend to make us sleep like, like we just kind of sink into them like this, right? And then we get into this kind of rounded position again. And when you think about it, we spend a lot of time in that rounded position. We bend down to tie our shoes, to pet our dogs, to pick up our kids, to, you know, a myriad of things, but how many times do you actually get to go this way? Like never, ever, 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 right? Unless you do it purposefully for a reason. So that's why we want to make sure that our spines are not in that continually rounded position all night long, but supported in a more neutral position and maybe even a little bit forward. And a more firm mattress will give you that. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I have a really cool, um, T-shaped, so it's almost like if you combine this with this, and um, I have this in my car seat because I hate the headrests pushing me forward all the time. So by having this in the lumbar area and then this in the what we call the thoracic area of your spine, it just 
pushes you forward and the headrest becomes kind of a non-issue and you're in that nice neutral position. Jeff loves it. <laughs> He hates it. He hates my thoracic spine support. He's like, get this guy. <laughs> what did Gabby call it? She called Iron it. Maiden. The Iron Maiden. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, yes, movement and moving in the opposite direction of what caused your discomfort is the key. So, mechanical pain is most often caused by something that we do repeatedly. Here's a good example for you guys. I started playing volleyball again after being out of it for three or four years. I was so scared. But yeah, just getting up and hitting the ball repeatedly, I was like starting to have some mechanical shoulder pain. So every time I went to, or serving, every time I went to serve, like it's all in this direction, right? Boom. So I found if I did the opposite, if I went this way a bunch of times before I went up to spike or serve, Sometimes I also had to add uh, the opposite internal rotation. I, I was still able to play. Now my shoulder was sore, but nothing was damaged. I didn't go to the doctor because he would have said, yeah, there's something clicking in there. You probably need surgery or maybe an MRI. And my shoulder's fine. So again, that's an example of mechanical pain that um, just needed a lot of movement in the opposite direction. Or folks that I see, so one day a week, um, besides having my scooter physical therapy business, one day a week I go into um, a big pharmaceutical company and just kind of meet with people at their desks. We figure out what ergonomically needs to be changed and what movements they can do in addition to better ergonomics to alleviate aches and pains. A lot of people with neck aches, a lot of people with back aches. So I'm having a lot of people doing, instead of being here and here, right, we're often in our protrusion and looking down positions, they're doing the opposite, retraction and extension. And just doing that five or six times, repeatedly throughout the day, five or six times a day, can make a huge difference, okay? You all want to try that? <laughs> so sit up nice and tall and straight. You want to start with your ears back over your shoulders. If you think of somebody coming in to give you a kiss or a punch that you don't want, what are you going to do? <laughs> Some, one of my patients or one of my clients was like, yeah, I'll just think of Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> so that's retraction. Uh. That's, a pretty, <laughs> that's a pretty important movement. Because when we're forward in protrusion all the time, it's almost like these parts of our neck are getting sublux. Or they're just almost getting like dislocated forward. Yeah. So by going into retraction, which I totally lose my chin when I do that, but by going back into retraction, we're just getting those vertebrae lined back up on each other. Okay, and then we're going a little bit further back when we go into extension, then we're getting the whole neck going in that opposite direction. So that's the number one movement, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, more, but just going in the opposite direction. Those are the two number, uh, I would say the two number one movements for neck, and then the number one movement for the back is just going into this position or laying on your stomach and doing like a cobra stretch. It's a very helpful um, movement for back pain. Okay, so first move. Secondly, move in the right direction, which is typically the opposite direction of what might have caused your pain. Um, and then if that doesn't seem to you know, get rid of your discomfort, that's when you would call me. <laughs> or somebody that can help you kind of figure out what caused your pain. What, what movements can you use, uh, because you, you bent forward and picked something up, what movements can you use to reverse that situation? Taylor and Tiffany as well can help you with that. Um, I won't get into that. There's a really great article, maybe you guys should read. Um, about that the direction of movement makes a huge difference, and that's a very popular, well-known article by Audrey Long. Did they talk about that at your course, Tiffany? The Audrey Long study? Do you remember? I don't remember. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it was two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's a little video, let me see if I can get this going, of a gardener using opposite direction movements. A gardener. Because <laughs> you know when you're gardening, you're totally bent over, right? So just 
as soon as I started to feel any kind of discomfort, I would stop what I'm doing and just do a bunch of those um, backwards direction movements, and then I could keep going. And, and doing that allows you to work longer before you're like, oh my gosh, um, my back is killing me, I have to stop. So yeah, eight, the research has shown that 80% of people who have mid-back, like thoracic or low back pain, respond favorably to extension. And the way we know that is this phenomenon called the centralization phenomenon, uh, which again has been studied and studied as well supported by research. A good surgeon will not do surgery on a patient who has, is showing signs of centralization. This is an example of um, one of my telehealth patients. When I first saw her, these were all the areas of pain she was having. So back of the head into that, you know, that famous trapezius muscle that gets blamed for everything, an all right-sided scapular, and then even a little bit into the front of the, the right shoulder, like she was afraid she had dislocated her clavicle. She's like, I can't think of what I would have done, but it feels like it's dislocated. See, they were again blaming, blaming something that uh, more anatomical. So by having her do opposite direction movements, she was like, yeah, all my pain is kind of moving towards that one spot like a localization of symptoms. And eventually her pain moved, like all her headache pain went away. Uh, this was after just two weeks of, of helping, kind of coaching her online. Um, and then eventually her pain went to the middle and was gone. That's called centralization. That's a 100% indication that that's the right direction of movement. If my patients aren't showing signs of centralization within the first two visits, then I'm gonna go in a different direction, literally. Um, and maybe try a lateral movement, or um, you know maybe rotation. So the body tells us exactly what it needs to get better. It, it knows, you know. Robin McKenzie was a genius. Uh, he came up with this system of mechanical diagnosis and therapy in the early 70s down in New Zealand, um, and you know we're just really starting to realize what genius that was. Okay, so common directional hacks. We talked about neck retraction and extension. Um, I, showed, I told you a little bit about shoulder extension and internal rotation. That's really great for any kind of front of the shoulder pain. Now, if somebody says to me, I'm having shoulder pain, what do you think I'm going to tell them? That's not your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> right, but a lot, of, a lot of people just are like, this is my shoulder. It's like, well, it kind of is. I, I call it the schneck, <laughs> the shoulder neck. But uh, any type of pain that's here is 100% of the time coming from the neck. And they, 70, what, what, what's the number on there? Oh, I didn't have a number. Again, about 78% of people need, who have pain here need to work on retraction and extension. Um, and then there's a smaller percentage that needs some type of side bend or rotation. Uh, people with anterior shoulder joint pain, sometimes it might go into you know the upper arm a little bit, need to just, you know, they've probably been, been doing a lot of this, forward reaching, forward lifting, so they need to go in the opposite direction. Um, knees, knees are so easy to fix. I love fixing knees. 90% um, of us have lost knee hyperextension. In other words, we've, when we have a knee pain, whether it's you know anterior, medial, lateral, um, most people are just not able to get that end range extension. You know, instead of taking a full stride, they're kind of doing this sort of a thing, and they might not even notice it. It might be very subtle. And I'll even say to people, okay, can you you know hyperextend your knee? In fact, while you're sitting there, try that. If, if your knee's hurting, this is a really good thing to do. So get your knee into fully straight and then go into a little bit more hyperextension, push above your knee, okay? And so you should feel a little bit of a pull in the back, okay? Now see if your other knee goes as far into that hyperextension. Most people who are having knee pain have lost some degree of that knee extension. So we use that movement repeatedly, whether sitting like you guys just did, sometimes we have to have them do it in standing, you know, propped up against the wall, kind of like Taylor is. Um, sometimes unilateral standing, so all the weight bearing is through that knee joint. 
But 90%, research is showing 90% of people just need to move into that hyperextension, similar to the back. We need to move into that hyperextension of the spine. Um, hips, same thing. They, they just need, you know, we're here all the time, right? Our hips are always bent. So we just need to move our hips into extension more. We need to get into that opposite direction. Elbows, where are we with our elbows all day long? Typing, 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 right? So, and this is a little bit unusual because there, we think of the arms as being a non-weight bearing joint, or being non-weight bearing joints, I should say. Um, but for some reason, elbows do very well with loaded extension and supination. So that looks like this. So again, if we're like this all the time, extension is straightening the elbows, turning the palms up, that's supination. But then by finding a, a tabletop and just loading our arm, getting that load into the elbow, and pushing into that a little bit further, hyperextension, we find that a lot of tennis elbow goes away pretty rapidly which if, you know, a true tendinopathy won't go away. It takes, you know, months <laughs> for a true tendinopathy to go away. But if there's just something out of position, sometimes there's even like a little piece of cartilage stuck in the joint, and just by moving into that opposite direction repeatedly, we move things out of the way that are causing the pain and getting the, the joint back to its normal resting position. Uh, Ankles and feet. So, has anybody had plantar fasciitis? Mm -hmm. It's no fun. Mm -hmm. So here's the here's the kicker. I've had mm, I would say half of the patients that I've seen that with plantar fasciitis, I don't move their feet at all. <coughs> and I tell them, let's make sure this isn't coming from your spine. We move their back, and their plantar fasciitis goes away pretty quickly in a couple weeks. So, so that would be the first thing to check. Anytime you have limb situations going on, check your spine. 50% of the time, your pain in your limbs is coming from your spine. So, uh, but if your spine doesn't change your pain, the next thing to do is to try one of these. Uh, now, dorsiflexion is this movement, okay? So if you have uh, heel pain, ankle pain, first thing to do is just move into this position repeatedly you might need to load it, which would be standing on it and, and getting in to go into that dorsiflexion position and loading. Because our limbs, our lower limbs are very much a weight-bearing joint. Or weight-bearing joints, I should say. Okay, well we're running out of time, so I'm not going to get into all of the how to heal, poorly healed tissues dysfunction, but um, that does take a lot longer. It's, it's not a rapidly reversible situation. Okay, so I have um, books that uh, tell you pretty much everything I've just said, um, gives you some advice about, um, I love this page, this is the panic page for the low back. When you have um, acute low back pain, the very first thing they say is to make sure that you have adequate lordosis, which is the rounding forward of the spine. So yes, that's the number one thing you can do. Um, so I've got these uh, on the table if you'd like to peruse them. If you want to buy one for me, you certainly can. Um, I've, I'm giving a little bit of an uptick on the price there for the convenience purposes, but <laughs> they're also available on Amazon. Um, and this is a really cool book too if you want to get a little more into it. Um, this talks more in depth about the McKenzie method, the mechanical diagnosis and therapy method. Um, and a lot of what I've said in, is in here and gets a little bit more in depth. Oh, there's a person laying with her cervical roll. <laughs> <laughs> See how it can go right underneath the, the pillow oh, and okay. kind of tuck into the pillowcase like that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, I also, oh, I forgot to say uh, ahead of time, if you want to be, uh, does it, anybody have a business card here with them? Me. You do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you you can't qualify for the like, raffle because you're a family member. <laughs> All right. Um, why don't we do this? Why don't um, why don't you just quickly write down your name and your email address, and then I will tear it up and we'll pick a name out of the hat, and then uh, whoever's name I pick can choose a book of their liking. Not this one, but uh, one of the four. Uh, treat your own. We have treat your own back. Treat your own neck. 
uh, treat your own shoulder and treat your own knee. Yeah, so a lot of these things are things that can be taken care of fairly rapidly on our own with a little coaching from a therapist or a chiropractor that knows how to help you. <laughs> Any questions? Anything that uh, you want me to explain a little bit further? I do have a question on mattresses. Have you heard of the purple mattress? Yeah. I had a patient reach out yesterday asking. I hate, I don't know a lot about mattresses. Some patients ask, I'm like, oh. Yeah. Um, but she reached out, and so I did some research, and I don't know if you know anything about it. It seems like a pretty good. I've heard good things about it. Yeah. We have the, um, believe it or not, the Wayfair version of, <laughs> nice. of the purple. Oh, which, okay. um, do you remember the name of that one? No, it's amazing oh, though. So. It comes all crunched in and slowly expands. Yeah. And it's like Ikea mattresses. Oh. Like Ikea do that. Do they yeah. also? Okay. We have an Ikea for a mattress and I love it. And it was so cheap. Mm. <laughs> it's like my favorite mattress. I think it was like $300 for a King mattress. Wow. It's my favorite, yeah. Wow. Well, I have to say, I've, I've had more patients than not tell me that the um, those adjustable uh, beds, you know, the sleep number beds, yeah. Are very. Uh, have you not had a good experience with those? My father-in-law did it. <laughs> yeah, I it just more sunk patients. down and right. yeah. 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 It, it gives up. Yeah. So it was yeah. like a coffin. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. It was. Just, so it wasn't I permanent. I've yeah. used one for years. I said I've had one for years, but I use it always pumped up to one hundred. Oh, I cannot oh, yeah. at all. But my husband it's uses his on like fifty. Yeah. But I'll tell you, and so you're yeah. like this. But yeah. mine's on one hundred because I need a hard, yeah, well, a hard mattress. Maybe he needs to talk to his neighborhood physical therapist. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a good question because, I mean, that's a huge investment. Yes. And so you don't want to steer somebody down the wrong road. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? That's me at the, the end of the W and OD trail. It actually does say trail mm -hmm. in. So I doctored it up. So it now says it's better physical therapy. <laughs> we got in trouble for painting like that, that, but we... <laughs> <laughs> well, good. Well, I appreciate you all coming. Yeah, um, you know, hopefully excellent. some of these things will be helpful to you. Oh, here's one thing I, I meant to show you. So one of the best things you can do if you're working on your laptop, um, as opposed to like, you know, a, a computer with a monitor, um, is get a nice laptop stand. I really like this little one, and um, it's very inexpensive. I got it for $20 at Amazon, and it comes in this really handy dandy carrying case. Um, and I did a little Facebook preview of it, and the folks at this company, they're in Europe, like wrote me back, they're like, that was great, we love hearing what the professionals think of our products, and so they got all kinds of people to like me on Instagram. Do you know it worked? But, um, so you see, you just open it up, and then you set your laptop. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and unplug this. I think we're all done talking about my PowerPoint. Um, you set your laptop into the front edge like so, and what that does is it brings the monitor up so that you can keep your head in that better position as opposed to being down low, you know, so you're having to protrude forward. But the thing is that you do have to then have um, a remote keyboard because Unless you're going to stand and work, then the keyboard is just too high, and then your your elbows are going to be bent way too much. So then you would have your remote keyboard hooked in. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Taylor. See, I do have a stand, but I have noticed now my elbows hurt. Yeah, I'm typing like this all day. Oh, so. okay. So get your dad to get your remote keyboard. <laughs> or husband. Or husband. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so then you would just plug that in and then uh, you would also need a, a remote mouse because you want to have the proper posture for working whether it's a standing desk like this. This is a wonderful one. Yeah. Uh, Amazon. Amazon. <laughs> um, you want to have your keyboard at uh, elbow height when your elbows are right by your sides at about 90 degrees. Ideally, you should have the, the top of the monitor parallel to the top of your head. Um, but this is as high as this goes. But it's so much better than having it down low. 
I like my stand. Yeah, I just noticed my elbows are starting to hurt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you definitely need the remote keyboard. Okay. Yeah. But you can also, until you get your remote keyboard, what can you do? Stretch my elbow. <laughs> In which direction, though? In which opposite. direction? Opposite. Right. Okay, I'm starting to so straighten and do this, and then it also helps to just get your wrist okay. to bend the other way too, because you're probably I'm typing like this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good example. Good example. Good. Um, so yeah, this is a handy thing to have. A standing desk is a handy thing to have if you're having to do a lot of sitting and typing. Good. Anything else? Any other questions or concerns? My card is up front, and so is Taylor and Tiffany's. And um, I do telehealth, so I see people online. Um, but I also can come here one day a week to see patients uh, to do more hands-on work too. So, Ooh. take it back to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, YouTube watcher. <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming. If you didn't get.